and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah. And before we get started talking about Fireheart Tiger by Aliette de Baudard, Sarah, what's something great that happened recently? My something good is that I finally am no longer a plague bearer. That is good. <laughs> yeah. So I, I caught COVID. We've postponed this episode multiple times because I caught COVID, which is my way of saying in advance. I have not reread the book since the date of our original recording, which was a while ago. So I might be a little rusty on the events of Fireheart Tiger. Sarah, you're not supposed to use the good things section for an apology. <laughs> <laughs> too late <laughs> but um, i am i am happy that i'm no longer testing a positive and feeling better hopefully. and feeling mostly better yeah yeah good well i'm glad that you're not miserable anymore <laughs> <laughs> and your good thing Ooh, my good thing is even better uh, <laughs> because i'm not gonna undercut it by anything <laughs> i went to a book signing by travis baldry up here in seattle this weekend. That sounds like fun. It was so much fun. It was lovely meeting him and he was so nice and getting my book signed, getting one signed for you. You're welcome. Best cousin. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, just going out and doing stuff. And yeah, it was really nice. I did drag Daniel with me and apparently Barnes and Noble has a great board game section. So oh, good. that was nice. <laughs> I'm still really sad that flights were way too expensive for me to make it there. Plus you had the plague. Yeah, I mean, I would have had to cancel anyway because I caught the plague. So I guess it's good that flights were too expensive, <laughs> but also... <laughs> uh, it would have been nice. Yeah. Conveniently, that's also my answer for whether I've read anything good lately. <laughs> <laughs> I did finally read Legends and Lattes. How exciting. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I am still hoping that we'll get it on the schedule for next year. I mean, yeah. I'm going to stop talking about it right now. So we have no excuse not to. <laughs> How about you? Have you read anything good lately? Well, because I was indisposed. Indisposed. <laughs> yes. Because I, I was confined to my bed. I read a lot. Luckily, I didn't have the kind of COVID brain fog that means you can't read. So I read about 12 Sherwood Smith books <laughs> in oh, <damn>. the <laughs> period of time that I was convalescing. Yes, I've been calling it, it's not even quite a silver lining. That's too good. But there have been a couple of copper outlines. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and one of those was reading all of these Sherwood Smith books that I had not read before. So that's been a lot of fun, actually. I did send a lot of text messages to Lily saying, this character is named one thing in this book. Now in this book, he's called something else, but there's no explanation. And in this third book, he goes back to his original name. I'm so confused. What's going on? In this fourth book, he's back to the second name. Finally, in the fifth book, there was an explanation that the second name was the title and that everyone in the country was so like afraid of him that they just called him by his title and not by his name. I enjoyed getting those texts immensely, <laughs> although I was not able to help you at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm glad you at least enjoyed my confusion. Well, I did rearrange the questions a little bit, not to throw a curveball at you or anything. I was just too excited to talk about Legends and Lattes. I mean, valid. But as far as what I am drinking this evening, it is not a latte because it's the evening and I'm not <laughs> a monster. <laughs> I am drinking Merlot, which is not my usual red wine, but my parents are staying with us and it is my mother's usual red wine. And uh, life is about compromises. <laughs> I'm being silly. I can't, I can't tell the difference. They're both in boxes. How about you, Sarah? I am drinking what Far West Cider Company calls a mellow mill, which is apparently like fermented honey and fruit. In this case, wildflower honey and Bing cherries. What's the difference between that and mead? I have no idea. I thought mead was just shit made with honey. <laughs> I thought so too. Maybe it's different because this specifically requires fruit. I don't know. I'm just going by what they told me on the back of the can. All right. <laughs> so enough. like take it up with them. I will. I'm going to write them an angry letter. But it's nice. I like it. I would buy it again. And the perfect thing to accompany us, I don't I don't know if that's true, uh, but I was trying to transition into Fireheart Tiger 
I mean, I think the perfect thing to accompany Fireheart Tiger would be tea. That's true. Because there's a lot of tea in this book. Is that the only justification you can think of for her? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, they drink a lot of tea in the book. No, so no, I, I meant... Oh, sorry, I was jumping ahead. <laughs> oh, I won't interrupt you this time. Please continue. <laughs> okay. Oh, we are reading this book because our patrons over on our Patreon, which we have a Patreon that you can support us at um, if you're hey, so inclined. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and twice a year, we are allowing our patrons to choose what we read within limitations. I mean, we we give them like some suggestions and they can vote. Okay, but if someone got a write-in and actually convinced more than two people to vote, I don't think we could justify ignoring that. I mean, (laughs) not to give you guys any ideas. True. You can always write in your your, uh, vote. So we are reading Fireheart Tiger because our patrons voted on this for our first patron chosen episode. What was the category for this one? award-winning novellas, I think? I believe it was Hugo-nominated novellas. There we go. And I had actually read the book before. I picked it up initially because it was billed as The Goblin Emperor, which I haven't read, meets Howl's Moving Castle, which I have read and watched in a pre-colonial Vietnamese-inspired world. And I was like, Howl's Moving Castle is exactly my jam. It sounds so cozy. I really want to read that. So I read it and I was very disappointed (laughs) because it is not really, it's a very good book. It's not a cozy book, I would say. So the first time I read it, I was in the mood for cozy and did not get it and thus did not really enjoy the book as much. And this time I knew what I was getting into and I really liked it. When you first said that you hadn't been in the mood for the kind of, I can say drama, right? And not like shitty high school drama. Like it's dramatic. There's a lot of relationship-centered tension in a lot of different ways. I was taken aback because I fucking love that shit. But I realized as much as I love it, I'm very much a uh, feast or famine reader with that type of storyline. Mm-hmm. There's only one week where that is literally all I do for seven days straight. <laughs> like read this kind of this kind of story where the main conflict is surrounding characters and their interpersonal relationships. And there is, of course, a lot of politics in this book as well, but even that is seen through a lens of interpersonal relationship. (laughs) And then I'll go months without touching it. So I uh, am forced to agree with you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I do. I do think that, you know, it's amazing how being in the right mood for a book really can make or break your enjoyment of it. And this book for me in particular not helped by the fact that I was expecting something more similar to Howl's Moving Castle. Oh, isn't that the problem with comparisons, though? Like, if you compare it to something, and then that's what the reader expects, and they don't get it, even if it's a really good book, it's like taking a bite of something and then finding out it's not what you thought it was. Yeah. It's going to be disgusting, even if the food is really good. Yeah. I mean, I think that comparisons do have a place in book selling and book recommending. But in this case, I thought that this one was a little off. I think there's a difference between if you liked, then try, then this book is similar to. Mm, Yeah, that's fair. And maybe that's splitting hairs, but that's different. Yeah, no, I can see that. Yeah. Anyway, I did really like this novella (laughs) book. It's a book. I really liked it this time. (laughs) I will say one of my first impressions of this story, however, was absolutely impacted by the fact that it's a novella. (laughs) I just, in the first page, there are like two paragraphs that are all exposition. I didn't mind, like I didn't have any problems with the exposition in the beginning of the book. I, I would have liked a little more story just because I like read it out a little. <laughs> well, like I, I liked the characters and I liked the setting. And so I would have liked more from it, but it was a novella. So, oh, you yeah, know, I, I think the story that we read was correct in the length that this was. Mm-hmm. I just think that that first page was doing a little bit too much heavy lifting. And it, I got through it. It's like I said, it's like two paragraphs. It's not the whole novella feels like a giant series that got compressed into a novella. (laughs) It just starts with 
a little bit of chunky exposition and you read it and then you know all that stuff and then you get the rest of the story knowing all of it. So, I mean, it worked. (laughs) I mean, your mileage may vary. I didn't feel that, but. It was just a little jarring. So much of Aliette de Bodard's stories feel, well, okay. We've only read (laughs) Servant of the Underworld. I was going to say, we've only read one other. So I, yeah, I let me not talk like I know what I'm talking about. The two works of hers that I've read (laughs) are so atmospheric. They both take place in settings that really know themselves, if that makes sense. Mm. And so getting shaken out of it with this just like chunk of, hey, here's what's going on. (laughs) Uh, I just noticed it. That's Mm. all. I noticed it. And like in Servant of the Underworld, I felt like it's a it's a significantly longer book. It's not a long book, but compared to this, it was. There was just a lot more space to work that in a little bit more naturally. That's fair. I'm not sure I entirely agree with you, but I can see where you're coming from. It was just the first page. I'm not like, this is not a problem <laughs> that followed me throughout the book. It might not have been a problem that the whole book had, but you did notice it. Exactly. At the beginning. Yeah. Well, speaking of similarities to Servant of the Underworld, you did have a point that they both feature a slow buildup of the supernatural. Yes, I love that. (laughs) In both of these works, there was a little bit of time at the beginning where you don't even know necessarily. Okay, also, I don't read the backs of books, so maybe it's just me. (laughs) And I'm sure they're probably in the fantasy genre. So like, yeah, of course, you know. I mean, the back does say worrying magical echoes of a fire. So yeah, uh, okay, fine. <laughs> you do, but if you're you just do looking magic. at the words on the page <laughs> as the story is told, in the beginning, you don't know necessarily if you were a true blank slate reader. <laughs> <laughs> They're talking about spirits and things, and you don't even know if that's real or if that's just, you know, cultural. Yeah, people in our world also talk about that stuff and say epithets or whatever that call upon supernatural concepts, but that doesn't mean they're real. (laughs) And so it starts off very much not even hinting at their existence, just hinting that the characters are familiar with those concepts. And then it slowly escalates and becomes more and more woven into the story. I really like that kind of pacing. And I say slowly woven into the story it's a novella. It happens pretty quick. <laughs> but yeah, this this book is 100 pages, 99 pages. So there's not that much page space for slow development. But if you like charted, I'm going to use my hands now. Sorry, listeners. <laughs> if you charted <laughs> the amount of magic on the page from beginning to end as like a an increasing line, the line would be the same or like it would be a pretty slow slope for the volume of the book you know yes okay just because 50 pages is 50 percent of the book it ends up going pretty quickly but relative to the length of the book it's a like gentle slope no I mean I again I don't disagree with you can you tell it's been a decade since I've (laughs) taken math (laughs) it's also been a decade since I read this book for our original (laughs) recording date so yeah I don't have any examples of that written down that was just my note (laughs) that's the kind of note taking I expect from me and not you I okay I've mentioned that I'm a sucker for this kind of the particular flavor of tension that's in this story so it's pretty obvious that I liked it but Sarah why should anyone else read this book you should read this book if you want political drama, if you want interpersonal drama, if you want a really uh, wonderful Vietnamese-inspired setting that you don't see or that is underutilized in in fantasy, in my opinion, our yeah, opinion. That was my way of trying to get around you apologizing for, maybe there's a lot of it, but we just haven't seen it, which is, is true. <laughs> I don't think there's a lot. I think I think there's more than more of it than we've read, but I don't think there's a lot of it. And I think there should be more. And that's why underutilized is the perfect word for that. <laughs> uh, there's a strong romance plot line. I would say the main plot line. 
There's also political intrigue viewed through the lens of familial drama. (laughs) Yeah, as expected, I really enjoyed the political intrigue in this book. And it was the kind of political intrigue that I can care about. (laughs) (laughs) So I think this novella really walked the line between our two specific tastes extremely well. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And I really need to talk about the love story, though, so we got to go to spoilers. (laughs) (laughs) To avoid spoilers, skip to 3025. Oh, man. The tension between Thon, the main character, and Eldris, her girlfriend slash fiance slash antagonist, <laughs> was incredible. Yeah, I think this was really, really well done. Seeing that buildup of, it's my ex-girlfriend whom I still love. I'm now in a relationship with her, even if it's kind of a hidden one because she's from the country that's kind of trying to invade us to oh she's actually not a good person and romantic partner is she oh but you forgot the step in between where <laughs> thon goes no we can't we can't be together and then eldris says yes we can i'll declare my love for you from the mountaintops and you're thinking you the reader are thinking okay that's great And that does feel like that solves a lot of the problems with their relationship, you know, trying to keep it hidden and is she really committed and all of that. And then after they get to that commitment level, that's when Thon finds out, oh, she like, (laughs) she wasn't just manipulating me. She really did truly care for me, but she is a terrible person. Or, no, I'm going to stick with terrible person. That's maybe a little dramatic, but I could, I could defend that statement. I mean, I think she's definitely racist. Okay, there you go. You're right. That's enough. (laughs) Yeah. And seeing, like, as the reader, seeing Thun kind of bypass that racism in the beginning stages of the novella gives you a hint that, like, oh, things aren't, things aren't actually necessarily all that you think they are. No, but it, the book sort of flips it on you because at first you think it's, oh, because Eldris is a playgirl that doesn't have the same connotations as playboy at all (laughs) oh no (laughs) do i just say call her a playboy (laughs) i don't like that solution either i mean eldris promiscuous but that's not the right vibe i don't know i think it is the right vibe she has many conquests i think is really what i want to say yeah eldris has many conquests and you spend The first, I'd say, half of the novella with the conflict between them that Thon thinks she's just another conquest, another notch on her bedpost or whatever. But then Eldris does, like, she proposes, she commits. She's like, you know, I'll make sure that my country doesn't invade your country. That's a pretty legit romantic gesture, all things considered. (laughs) I mean, but it wasn't so much... I promise that my country won't invade your country as like, I promise that I will grant you rule over your, like it, it's right. You know? Oh no, we're getting to how she's not actually great. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> like That was a solid romantic gesture. If it didn't have strings attached. Well, that's the thing. Her relationship was genuine. It's just the genuine relationship was from a deeply troubled person. <laughs> The problem was not, does she really care about me? The problem is, how does she demonstrate her care? (laughs) And Mm. is that healthy Mm -hmm. or bearable or, you know, not going to cause a war? (laughs) (laughs) And I really enjoy dysfunctional relationship storylines. That's a guilty pleasure of mine that this novella hit on perfectly. (laughs) Oh, Thon and Eldris, like they're the slow descent. It's the perfect um, comedy versus tragedy, right? In a comedy, the center of the book is a high point. No, other way around. In a comedy, (laughs) the middle of the story is the lowest point, and in the end, things are happy. And in a tragedy, the middle of the story is the highest point, and in the end, is tragic. And their specific story between the two of those characters is absolutely a tragedy. Mm -hmm. 
like you get that middle high point where Eldra says she's going to fix everything and she's going to take care of you. And she does love you. You know, you are worthy of love and like all of those things that Thon wanted to hear for so long. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah, I guess I was going to disagree with you about the tragedy, but then you clarified that it's specifically their storyline and not the book as a whole. No, I don't. I don't think the book has a sad ending. No, I don't think so either. Yeah. But their story, yeah, their specific relationship has a tragic plot arc. (laughs) How's that? That's, that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely, you do, you do get that high point and then it's all downhill from there. On the flip side, during all of this very political, very real world centered conflict, also Thon is haunted by a fire spirit. (laughs) It isn't quite the right word. I mean, it kind of, it, kind of destroys her life for a little while before she realizes that she has this fire spirit companion yeah it kind of destroys her life a little bit (laughs) we start the book where thon thinks she has the power to create fire that she can't control and is constantly worried she's gonna burn down everything (laughs) she's very stressed about it which that's i mean understandable yeah and then eventually yang reveals herself to her and that it's actually a fire Spirit? Is that the right entity? I think spirit. It feels right anyway. Yeah, that feels right. Yeah. And then we get their relationship growth and we find out that Thon had saved a servant girl from a burning building, but it was not actually a servant girl. It was Yang taking human form for the first time. And so Yang is not obsessed with Thon. That's not fair. Elemental. Elemental. That yeah, that's that's yeah. better than that fits better. Sorry to completely <laughs> derail okay. your, your train of thought. But Thon is the only person that Yang knows or trusts. <laughs> so she's just sort of followed her as a flame elemental for years. Years? Yeah. I do think it's years. Yeah. But then they finally meet sort of face to face and get to know each other and have their sort of relationship growth at the same time. <laughs> I do really enjoy seeing their relationship grow and seeing the counterpoint between Gyan, who really does want the best for Thon in a way that centers Thon as a person, versus Eldris, who wants what Eldris thinks is best for Thon. And Thon's mother, who similarly only wants what's best for the country, which if you're the ruling a country, I guess that is. Kind of <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to say, I mean, I think that's a little more justified. Oh, way more justified than Eldris, but that's still not a comforting relationship for Thon as a person. No, yeah. her relationship with her mother is not a source of comfort. No. Whereas, yeah, Yang is the only person who really puts Thon first. Yeah. Because, you know, we find out that Eldris did genuinely care for her, but the kind of care that she shows is not yeah. acceptable. Yeah, I was going to say in a very self-centered, racist way. I mean, the climax of the book, Eldris tries to kill Thon. I didn't think that she was trying to kill her, but definitely... Was she choking her? I definitely thought that she was attempting to do serious bodily harm. She became physically abusive, if nothing yes. else. yes. Because she thinks Thon is cheating on her because she heard voices in the room and the other voice was Yang. And okay, they do end up in love at the end. So maybe cheating on her was an incorrect assumption. I mean, she she wasn't at that point. She didn't have any kind of like physical relationship with Yang. I think you could argue that she had an emotional relationship, but I mean. I don't think it was romantic at that point. Or at least not on Thon's side. Yeah, like that could also just be friendship, you know? I don't think you can ascribe one-to-one comparisons when she's literally the only person in the entire world Gong talks to. (laughs) Fair. (laughs) But also, Eldris was right. There was someone else in her room. But that's a... But it's an unacceptable reaction. Overreaction, yeah. Yeah, no, sorry. I was not trying to say that her her response (laughs) to that situation was correct. Just that her assumption was not entirely incorrect. Yeah, there was there was someone in the room, but that doesn't mean that you can 
try to hurt your significant other. Well, no. Even if she was fucking the whole palace, the reaction shouldn't have been to try to hurt her. No. (laughs) Or to successfully hurt her and try to kill her or however was happening there. That's not the point. (laughs) I will say, and this is 100% a me problem, not a book problem. (laughs) But the book used terms of endearment that I understand are maybe not a direct translation, but a cultural equivalent sort of thing. Yang and Thon call each other big sis and little sis because Thon is taking care of Yang, basically. Again, only person she knows in the entire world and teaching her how to be a person and all of that. So it's a very close relationship and that those are phrases that are used in other languages, but then they start smooching and they're still using those phrases. <laughs> <laughs> and it just took me out of the story because every time I got to that, I'd have to stop and go, Lily, you know, you know what's happening here. They aren't literally sisters. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> See, I didn't have any issues with the the terminology, like in and of itself. I just hate the word sis, like as an abbreviation of sister. Yeah. Lil, Lil, apostrophe yeah. sis. <laughs> Again, it's, I assume that is just the closest approximation to a phrase in Vietnamese. I would have preferred big sister, little sister. But doesn't that feel more formal? I think they were trying to go for a casual. I don't know what the Vietnamese equivalents or their levels of formality are. So I assumed that's what was happening there anyway. Because Probably. Yeah. Why would you say Lil ever? (laughs) Yeah. Even though it was in English, it took some mental translation from me. And it did make their, not love scenes, but the scenes where they get together and express romantic interest in each other less seamless than they could have been, which is 100% entirely my own problem. (laughs) The other thing that's my own problem (laughs) is that I might really enjoy dysfunctional romantic relationships in storylines. But dysfunctional family relationships just stress me out. (laughs) And Thon and her mother definitely have a, well, not a supportive, happy, healthy relationship. They have a fraught relationship. There's a lot of tension between, between the two of them. There's a lot of baggage. Her mother, in my opinion, does not respect her at all. But Thought eventually sticks up for herself, and I immediately start cheering in my head, like, yay, you're doing it, you're growing. And then it kind of backfires, and then I don't get to be happy about it anymore. And I was like, no. I mean, it's it's not that it's a total failure, though. I, right? Like, how come I could enjoy her relationship with Eldris crashing and literally burning, <laughs> but her having like an okay like improved but still not great relationship with her mother and that bothers me so much (laughs) it's definitely uh differing priorities i think i one of those plot lines i just enjoyed like reading the dysfunction of i can't i don't people like soap operas that's not weird right (laughs) it's not weird (laughs) yeah but the family i just want i just want all families to be happy and supportive (laughs) me (laughs) Well, you don't get that entirely with this one. No, I do think I would. Well, we really don't know what happens after the entire palace burns down. Yeah, like I want a second novella in this world. I think it'd be interesting. I think for the story that we read, this was the right length for the story, but it was a short. Well, it was not a short story. It was a novella. It was a short. You know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And I do think there was a lot of room there to see how these characters grow and what happens between Thon and her mother after this almost literal explosion in their faces. What happens between Thon's home country and Ephteria? Oh, see, that was not even on my list of questions. <laughs> I see. I just there, like I, I agree. I think the length of this novella was perfect for the story that was being told. And it's good that we still have questions, right? That means it hooked us. But I do want like a second novella, you know, answering some of these questions. I would read that. Yeah. I would be really curious to know how 
I mean, Thon had finally started getting some autonomy, not autonomy necessarily, but she was allowed to work independently. She wasn't 100% supervised by her mother at all times in her work as she was like kind of an ambassador, right? She Mm -hmm. was writing letters to other countries. And then this happens. (laughs) Oh, poor thing. I was going to say she just needs a hug, but at least Yang is there to give her one. She's had a bit of a rough time of it. It's true. So I do have a a pet peeve that I only remembered because Fireheart Tiger is so perfectly the opposite of it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's a promising start to this pet peeve corner. There is this terminology regarding fantasy or regarding the world building of fantasy worlds where the magic can either be a soft magic system or a hard magic system. And I'm sorry, if you wanted to read about a hard magic system, just go play fucking d and <laughs> I don't want to be sitting here worried about spell slots and shit while my characters are going through an adventure. Like, I want to read about the characters doing stuff, not, guess I need to take a long rest now. I mean, I don't think that that's specifically what hard magic refers to. Isn't hard magic just like a magic system that has more defined like rules? Not necessarily, you know, you can't, you have spell slots and you have to take a rest. No, but... they never admit that there are spell slots, but that's always what it boils down to. And in my head, I'm like, <laughs> okay, all right now. I mean, I find the terms kind of opaque and confusing, but really that is just my experience of reading hard magic system i can't even say it with a straight face it's just so uninteresting to me like oh you want to like sit down and write all of the rules go write a tabletop rpg why is this in a book books are supposed to be fun to read i think it's really interesting to read a world that does have very defined rules and regulations for its magic use though i i'm sure it can be done well like Okay, yes. I'm sure there is a book out there with a hard magic system that I would read and go, okay, I'm all right with it. I think there are lots of it. I think you've probably read some and you just don't realize that they're considered hard magic systems. I probably did. And I found it extremely distracting, but not worth bringing up. (laughs) To me, like that kind of stuff, just, I don't know. I don't care. It jars me out of it. I do want worlds to be internally consistent. If they start contradicting themselves, then I get very annoyed. But beyond that, I really don't care. Mm. If the author needs that for themselves, great, but I should not know about it as the reader. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I think it I think it depends on the plot and the characters. There are some situations where it makes sense that the reader gets more and I'm not saying that you necessarily need to know all of the details or need to have it spelled out like very strictly, but I think there are some storylines where it does make sense for you as a reader to get some of that background through what happens in the story and like what the characters learn as they progress along the plot. And I do not enjoy those nearly as much. (laughs) That is why it's my pet peeve. (laughs) That's fine. (laughs) Right? Like it's a spectrum. I'm just saying that when that is a factor in a story, I tend to enjoy it much, much less than I would have otherwise. Yeah, I mean, your mileage may vary. I don't have to defend myself because it's my pet peeve and I can be as irrational as I want. (laughs) I don't want to close the door for all hard magic, quote unquote, hard magic books forever. I'm just saying that's probably not the aspect of it that I liked if I did like one. It was a necessary evil. I mean, that's valid. I enjoy it. As expected, we have two very (laughs) differing opinions on this. Uh, Well... But personal taste, et cetera, et cetera. That's why it's my pet peeve (laughs) and not like, this is my decree of all things that are bad always and that no one should enjoy. That's a whole different podcast. (laughs) (laughs) That's a very different podcast that we're probably not qualified to to run. Oh, I am. (laughs) But no one would believe me. (laughs) (laughs) No, no one would believe you. This is very true. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We are on Twitter and Instagram at FictionFansPod. You can also email us at FictionFansPod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and follow us wherever your podcasts live. Our link tree 
also has a link to our Patreon, where you can support us and find our show notes and a bit of other nonsense. Thanks again for listening, and may your villains always be defeated. Bye! Bye.